Uh, my name is James Anlitis. I'm chair of the Department of Physics here at Berkeley. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 24th annual J. Robert Oppenheimer Lecture. Now, uh, the Oppenheimer Lecture, annual lecture, was established in 1998, and it's made possible through the generosity of Jane and Robert Wilson, as well as Steve and Arlene Krieger. The series has brought a who's who of theoretical physicists. Past Oppenheimer lecturers have included C.N. Yang, Freeman Dyson, Helen Quinn, Charlie Kane, Andre Linder, Murray Gell-Mann, Stephen Hawking, Kip Thorne, Marvin Cohen, and last year, Lenny Susskind. Many prominent theorists in the fields of particle physics, condensed matter, astrophysics, cosmology, and AMO have stood where I'm standing today. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Robert Oppenheimer, the person. He was born in 1904, growing up in an upper middle-class family in Manhattan. He graduated from Harvard, majoring in chemistry, entered Cambridge University in the UK in 1924 as a graduate student, hoping to work with Ernest Rutherford. Who, but then he left in 1926 uh, to finish his PhD with Max Born in Göttingen. Uh, I should point out that I try and tell my students that they could be the next Robert Oppenheimer in my own group, since Ro Ernest Rutherford was an, a fellow Kiwi. Um, but I, I usually don't tell them that he left after two years. Uh, anyway, he published more than a dozen papers while with Born, mostly focused on the new theory of quantum mechanics. This included his most famous work, the Born Oppenheimer approximation, that still is important in the fields of particle physics, condensed matter, and nuclear physics, as well as many other areas. Uh, now, uh, he published uh, more than 90 years ago, in 1929, after two years of postdoctoral study, mostly in Europe, Oppenheimer returned to the United States, and he accepted an associate professorship from Berkeley, where he remained for the next 15 years. During this period, he published his famous work with Volkov, establishing the tolman oppenheimer volkov limit on the maximum mass of a neutron star, the mass above which a star must collapse into a black hole. Now, this area remains relevant today as we study gravitational waves from the mergers of black holes and neutron stars. At Berkeley, Oppenheimer's group typically was eight to 10 graduate students and several postdocs, and Oppenheimer visited them every day, a standard that I try and avoid um, uh, but no, all kidding aside, uh, uh, one of the most uh, famous components about uh, Oppenheimer's legacy, uh, as, as, as um, expressed by Hans Bethe, is that he probably had his most important ingredient of his science was, and, and to his teaching is his, his, exquisite, his exquisite taste that he had in finding important problems. Okay. Now, the scientific leadership of Oppenheimer demonstrated at Berkeley complicated his later life and his role in science. In 1942, he was selected to lead the World War II Manhattan Project's engineering lab, sited in Los Alamos, uh, near the ranch that Oppenheimer owned. His leadership of this effort culminated in the successful Trinity test and later the political decision to use atomic weapons against Japan, a decision that troubled Oppenheimer for the rest of his life. After World War II, Oppenheimer became the public face of science and technology, featured on covers of Time and Life magazine. This period of his life came to a close with the controversial loss of his uh, security clearance in Los Alamos in 1954, a time when a new Cold War and McCarthyism were at their peak. This, there was some resolution many years, a decade later, when President Kennedy presented Oppenheimer with the nation's Fermi Award. Now, Oppenheimer's legacy at Berkeley is a simpler one, summarized by a plaque on the fourth floor of Physics South Hall with another quote from Hans Bethe. In these corner offices, 1929 to 1942, J. Robert Oppenheimer created the greatest school of theoretical physics the world has ever known. Berkeley Physics strives to continue this legacy today. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague from UC Berkeley Physics, Professor Chris McKee, to introduce tonight's Oppenheimer lecturer, Dr. Hans Bildston. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, James. It, it gives me great pleasure tonight to uh, introduce tonight's uh, speaker, Lars Bildston. Uh, Dr. Bildston attended graduate school at uh, Cornell University, where he was a Hertz Fellow. 
After that, he was a, a postdoc for several years at Caltech before coming here to Berkeley, where he served on the faculty for a period of uh, between four and five years. Unfortunately for us, he was then attracted to uh, UC Santa Barbara, and uh, so he, he left and he's, he remains there today as the Gluck Professor of Physics. Part of the reason that he was attracted to Santa Barbara was the presence of the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics there, and uh, he got an appointment uh, at that institute. Uh, it was, at that time, it was directed by uh, David Gross, one of the most prominent theoretical physicists um, of his era. And uh, in 2012, Lars took over from uh, uh, Gross and is now the uh, director. The, um, this, uh, the, this institute is really a mecca for theoretical physicists and astrophysicists, bringing re in researchers uh, from postdocs to senior professors for periods of several months to tackle some of the most challenging problems in physics today. And the Institute has flourished under Lars's uh, able leadership. Dr. Bilden is a theoretical astrophysicist who is recognized for his work on the properties of stars, both while they are burning their nuclear fuel, which lasts over a period of millions to billions of years, and also when they end their lives in spectacular explosion of supernovae. The, uh, most recently, he has been working on the variability of stars much more massive than the sun uh, just prior to their explosion as supernovae. He's also avidly engaged in the observational field of time domain astronomy by his longstanding collaborative efforts with the worldwide Las Cumbres Observatory and the Zwicky Transit Facility at Palomar. In addition to his university teaching and research, he has devoted significant effort to strengthening science and engineering in grades seven to 12. Um, Dr. Billson has received many awards, including the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship, the Helen B. Warner Prize of the American Astronomical Society, and the Danny Heinemann uh, Prize for Astrophysics. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2018 and was elected as a legacy fellow of the American Astronomical Society in 2020. Tonight, Dr. Billson will present Hearing the Stars, New Insights into Stellar Interiors. He will provide his insight into how theory, together with space-based observations of stars within our galaxy, have had a remarkable impact on our understanding of the universe. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Lars Bilson. Great. OK, and everyone can hear me? So what I want to talk about this evening is a remarkable progress, both theoretical and observational, on really seeing with telescopes the fact that stars are varying quite dramatically. So <clears throat> as I go along in this talk, I will absolutely highlight uh, what I want you to come away with from this talk, which is that when you look up at the sky, if your eyes were only able to detect changes in a part in 10,000 of the brightnesses of the stars, you'd be seeing a movie every night, uh, not a still image. And of course, we're able to do that with telescopes, as I'll show you this evening, um, and use that information of how those stars are varying to understand their distances, their masses, their ages, and how big they are in physical size. So before I do that, um, I need to give you a little bit of a primer on the types of properties of these stars we're going to study, which is really standing waves in the star. So to do that, I want to first remind you of what a sound wave is. I'm going to give you a, a story of unusual things that happen in the Earth's ocean and how you can use sound waves to probe properties uh, within bodies. I'm going to then tell you about the nearest star the sun, and how we've learned how to do the science that I'm going to talk about by really studying in detail the sun, and then we're going to go outside of our solar system. So that's tonight's plan. Um, I definitely will pause a few moments during the talk to take questions, because I think it's much more fun for me uh, to get questions during the talk than to force all of you to hold them uh, up, even though I saw that on the schedule. So pardon me, James, if I'm deviating from the plan. Okay, <clears throat> so let's first talk about what a sound wave is. Well, it's what you're hearing right now. It's the response of, in this case, air, 
to compressing the air. And it's, what it is is a compression rarefaction wave. But in this room, uh, this is the speed of sound uh, in, OK, this, it, can you maybe see it? It's a little bit, sorry. <clears throat> it's about 350 meters per second. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to use mixed units this evening. I'll use, when I talk about the Earth's ocean, you'll see feet, which is unusual for a physicist. Um, thankfully, I took out the fathoms, because that's a harder one. Um, but that's the speed of sound for the temperature of this room, which is roughly around 300 Kelvin. Those are the units we like to use. And you can use sound waves to actually triangulate, as you know. So let's start uh, by reminding you what the wave is. So it has certain properties. So I will have some equations this evening. We're going to start pretty simple. But this is what a sound wave looks like. It's basically a propagating disturbance of an area that's rarefacted and an area that's compressed. The frequency of the wave is given by the sound speed. That's the CS divided by the wavelength. The wavelength is the distance between the peaks. And of course, shorter wavelengths are higher frequency. And for those of you who have musical instruments, you know that the smaller the instrument, the higher the frequency, the larger the instrument, the lower the frequency. And we're going to do that in stars. Stars exhibit the same phenomena. Stars that are very large can have very low frequency response. Stars that are compact have very high frequency response. So I'm going to divert to an unusual thing because it's a great story. And it's about sound and water. And this has nothing to do with the rest of the talk. But these three slides are so much fun, I can't not tell you. So first off, water is very different. The speed of sound in water depends on its compressibility. To you, water is incompressible. But of course, it's not totally incompressible. If you compress it, it does resist. Um, and that gives a sound speed. And it's much faster than the speed of sound uh, in air. It's about 1,500 meters per second, so it's four times faster. But if I go into the ocean, there's some interesting phenomena that can happen. As I go down into the ocean, so here's my first question. So we're sitting here roughly in one atmosphere, right? That's the definition of where I'm standing. But some of you probably know how deep you have to go in water to have the pressure double. Are there any scuba divers? Not one. One scuba diver, how deep do you go? 10 meters, exactly, right? So if you go 10 meters into water, the pressure is twice that of this room. And as the pressure increases as you go deep, the sound speed actually increases due to the pressure increasing. Okay? So you have to go pretty deep to have a big change. But that's, that's one reason the sound speed increases. But the sound speed also knows about the temperature of the water. If the water's hotter, its sound speed's a little faster than if the water's colder. Those two things end up giving you a very unusual arrangement uh, for the speed of sound in water. And it looks like this. So this is an unusual plot. Uh, oceanographers plot things, at least to me, that's sort of backwards. The sound speed is, to the, is on the x-axis, and it's in this beautiful unit of feet per second. But notice a very small dynamic range. Okay, It's 5,000 feet per second, 4850. So it's almost a constant number. And then this is depth. So as you go deeper in the water, generically, go down to 13,000 feet, uh, the sound speed is faster. Okay. However, as you get to the surface, depending on your latitude, the sound speed also rises. So if you're near the equator, it's hot. And the sound speed rises up to a value which is almost the same as the sound speed at depth. And this is because the surface of the water is hot. If you go to northern latitudes, this is different because it's colder. And this is the profile. Okay. <clears throat> so the reason I'm telling you this is because in stars and in <clears throat> this case, if I have a wave that's moving, and let's say it's going down into a region where the sound speed's changing, uh, that wave will get deflected. It gets deflected via sort of an optic Snell's law, for those of you who've done optics. And the same thing happens in, in um, this case. So what happens is, as the wave is going down into the ocean, if it's a grazing wave, it's going to get reflected at some point and come back up. Okay, and again, you sort of know this, the fact that uh, sound bounces off water. 
that's again, it's going into a place where the sound speed's four times higher. We're now talking about something much different. But what this means from this is that if I go to this location, let's say I'm, I'm at 19 degrees north latitude in the ocean and I'm at 3,000 feet down, I go to this place and I send out a sound wave that's moving exactly this way, it'll just propagate happily. If I send it up, up, it goes into a place where the sound speed's increasing, and therefore it gets bent back. If it goes down, it gets bent back as well because it's moving into a place with the sound speed increasing. So this ends up making a channel. So how many people know how we measure the Earth's ocean temperature at 3,000 feet? It's this phenomena. If you really want to measure the temperature of the Earth, you can measure this channel. So you can do the exercise, and this next plot is the busiest plot I will show, which is why I put it at the beginning of the talk. <clears throat> what this shows is I'm sitting over here to the left, so the, to the right is just moving down, you know, going across the ocean. So I'm sitting here at, in this case, the, now here's fathoms. I'm sorry, I didn't get rid of fathoms. Okay, so here I set off an explosion. The, the ray that goes up 15 degrees, which is the, the scales are compressed, the 15 degree ray just off the um, horizontal goes up and reflects, and the ray that comes down 15. So it's showing you that these rays that are nearly transverse just keep propagating. So you take what would be a three-dimensional event, and all the rays in a narrow channel stay, and they spread as a two-dimensional spreading. Okay, so if things are spreading in two dimensions instead of three, they propagate and keep a large amplitude. So uh, this was discovered by Ewing in, in the 40s. A few pounds of TNT in the ocean off the coast of Africa was detected in the Bahamas. And it's all because the rays were spreading into just a two-dimensional sheet, okay? So how many people knew this? One, two, awesome. Okay, so I'm doing really well. <clears throat> well, you'd like to make use of this. Does anybody know how this was used during the war? Yes. Uh, not at this time. Yeah, no, not at this time. Submarines are a good idea. Yes. Rescuing pilots, jackpot. Rescuing pilots. So pilots were given a small charge, and given their latitude, they knew where to set the depth charge, so that if they landed where they didn't want to land, AKA in the ocean, they would drop their charge, and it would set off an explosion at the depth associated with that minimum. And it would send signals. This is from, this is from Popular Mechanics, 1949. Uh, this, is, this is me kind of Xeroxing two different little, but it's showing Schematically, here's the poor down pilot. They here see 4,000 feet, so they told you where it was. And then they had listening stations at different areas, so for those of us in California. And this was a way to actually geolocate down pilots uh, during the war. Okay, so that's nothing to do with stars, but it's just such a cool story. Uh, I can't not tell it. Okay, so now let's go off the Earth and let's do a star. How do you understand a star? Very simply, it's an ideal gas that is holding itself up due to the pressure of the gas. So what that implies is that the, 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 as the object changes its radius, so what I'm showing here is that big M is the mass of the star. This is the radius of the star. This is just the mass of a proton. G is a gravitational constant. Uh, this is the Boltzmann constant, and this is the central temperature, or the mean temperature of the, of the gas. And the need for it to hold itself up ends up basically demanding that the temperature be of order of the gravitational energy, what we call the virial theorem. And so as a star gets more compact in radius, the temperature rises, or if the mass is less, the temperature is lower. But this relationship uh, pretty much holds for all the stars I'm going to talk about today. It works well for the sun. This tells you the sun temperature is about 10 million Kelvin. That's what sets the temperature. It's the size of the star. Nothing to do with fusion, just to be clear. It's the size of the star. 
So let's just do the math of I've got a star, it has a certain temperature, I know how to calculate the sound speed. If the temperature is higher, the sound speed's higher. What's the time it takes for a sound wave to just go around the star or go through a star if I'm being a little bit loose? Um, well, because of this relationship, it's the same roughly as the time it takes for a particle that's orbiting at the surface of the star to do an orbit, what we call the dynamical time. And for something like the sun, this is roughly an hour. Okay. So if we're going to think of sound waves going around a star, this is the time scale that's going to matter. And so let's start with the nearest star, the sun, which, for which we have a big advantage. Not only is it bright, but you can look at small spots on it. For all the other stars we're going to talk about, you cannot do the latter. You're stuck seeing the whole disk. But let's start with the sun, because this is where we really cut our teeth as a physics community, astrophysics community, and understanding how um, waves get created and propagate in a star. So in the sun today, uh, there's a core in which the fusion is occurring of hydrogen to helium. We're about halfway done. So in about 5 billion years, the core will burn out. It's hydrogen, and there'll be a ball of nearly pure, well, it's basically would be pure helium with some other elements, but no hydrogen. There's a layer in which the heat is escaping just via diffusion of heat. But then the outer, uh, roughly one third of the radius, is vigorously convecting. It's impossible for the heat to get out via just slow diffusion. Instead, it triggers convective motion. So this is vertical and transverse motion that is transporting the heat out via vigorous convection. So that's the structure of the sun. Um, back in the 60s, it was discovered that there really were some persistent oscillations. There was very distinctive time scale seen. Uh, roughly, in this case, about five minutes for the sun is what was detected. And the, all of these motions uh, also, when you would look at patches, had pretty large coherence. So you could see waves going around. You could, you could distinguish waves that are going through and coming out the other side. Today, when there's a sunspot on the backside or an eruption on the backside, waves come around and we can see the waves come around the front side. You can actually use that maybe to uh, predict if there's going to be a coronal mass ejection. But the sun is nearby. The understanding of this presence of all of these ringing and oscillations completely has to do with the fact that this is a vigorously convecting object, which is really, really noisy. And so many of you, uh, well, not, not today, but we used to have cars uh, that at certain speeds would rattle. Uh, I think this is somehow gone. At least my car still does it. But, but you know, there's resonances within anything, and the noise ends up creating resonances, and those resonances get to large amplitudes. And so how we understand what we see in the sun in terms of all of these waves, which are really standing waves, has to do with the fact that convection over time creates an amplitude spectrum of many, many waves. And if you want to think of it, it's really a musical instrument with many possible tones. I can have a wave which has four or five nodes to the center. I can have a wave of much higher frequency where there's higher frequency oscillations. I can do the same thing going around the star. Not all of these are going to be available to us for distant stars, but some will. So what, did, um, what do these waves look like when they're propagating? Well, this is important because this is going to help us understand what we can do in stars that are far away. So what's shown here schematically are waves which have different amounts of what we call, um, if you think of the trajectory towards the center. So a wave that is nearly radial uh, basically gets bent but very little. A wave with a high tangential um, direction gets bent at this coordinate. So this is the reflections I was talking about. So a wave which is trapped and goes all the way around the surface cannot get to the interior. Uh, waves with what we would call lower L, for those who are physicists in the crowd, uh, get to get to higher depths. But in this case, when we look at distant stars, there's some things we're not going to be able to see. We're not going to be able to see a wave like this red one because of the cancellation of the intensity around the surface of the star. OK. So I'm now cutting out 20 years of work by others. 
to give you the punchline of what you could say for the sun. So if I go back, I see waves, some of which get near the interior, some of which don't, but you can use that to then dissect the sound speed as a function of radius in the sun. Right? You use the properties of the different waves um, to do that, and this is the result. So on the x-axis is showing the radial coordinate relative to the surface. So here's the surface of the sun to the far right. Here's the interior. And this is the, they cho chose to write this as the square of the sound speed. So this is uh, roughly, this should be, um, well, it's this, the square of the sound speed. So as you go into the sun, as I said, there's heat that's transporting. So it's, this is equivalent to temperature. So the temperature is rising as you go in. But then you see this interesting thing at the center. The sound speed goes down. Now this is a quiz for those who want to be so brave. The temperature, I will tell you, is uniformly rising as I go to the center. Why would the sound speed drop? Yes. Yes, please. No. The, 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 as you go into the star, the density is rising, but the sound speed does not know about the density of the material. What does the sound speed know about? It's an ideal gas. Yes? It, that's correct. So the answer is that uh, it all starts as mostly hydrogen, but as at the center, it's been fusing and there's more helium, and helium is a heavier atom than hydrogen, and therefore the sound speed drops. For those of you who inhaled a helium balloon recently, um, you know that the pitch goes up, right? Nobody's done this? <laughs> Ever? Okay, I'm not some, I'm probably in trouble now. Um, but that's because you're replacing air, right? And air is mostly nitrogen and oxygen, so its atomic weight is 28, and helium's four. Okay, so that's evidence of the fact that we were pretty confident of which is that at the center, the, helium, the abundance of helium is, has risen because of fusion over time. Um, and then if Wick is here, he can tell you how this impacted the solar neutrino problem, but that's another talk. Um, but the point is, this, uh, this was quite profound. You can do a lot of things. You can measure the rotation rate within the sun. So this is showing, uh, as a function of the radius of the, where you are in the sun, its rate of rotation. It's roughly rotating as a rigid body at the center. This dashed line is the place above which you have this vigorous convection. And you see that the rotation varies. It's faster at the equator than the pole. You see this in sunspots. But you can now measure as you go deep in that it becomes uniformly rotating. Again, this is from, this is from helioseismology. Um, I'm not going to show you this evening, but for other stars, we're doing this, but not at this level of detail. But we are able to now infer rotation, both surfaces and interiors. Okay. So what I want you to, to think about is that when you look at the sky, so this is a, anybody know any astronomers in the crowd? Pleiades, very good. Okay, okay, that was an easy one. That was, that was Gabor got that just like that, yeah. This is for you, Gabor. This one is the Pleiades, yeah. But this is really a movie. And this is what I really want you to, to take away. It's unfortunate that the amplitudes of the variability is not visible to the naked eye. But if it were, you'd go out every night. And, you know, the brightest star tonight is the faintest star. And you'll discover that, oh, it's oscillating. You know, every five hours, the period's changing. I mean, I'm sorry, the brightness is changing. And another star, you know, suddenly is doing something different. It would be super exciting. Um, and unfortunately, that's just not available to us because our eyes are not that great. But again, to go back to the sun, you don't get to see everything, okay? So if you just ask, you put a disturbance on a star, um, disturbances that have small amounts, uh, have long wavelengths that are of order the size of the star would give you a change in brightness. Everything I'm going to talk about from now on is a measurement of just the brightness of a star. For the sun, we were using Doppler measurements to get velocities, but for distant stars, we just get the brightness. So that 
Data I'm gonna show you in the results this evening and our theoretical understanding is really just based on measuring how bright a star is as often as you can. That's it. And things like this, which have a lot of plus minus plus minus all cancel out, and so you don't get to see these types of waves in distant stars. You can only see what we call the lowest possible L. You could see a radial oscillation, the breathing mode, and you could see some of these, but that's it. Okay, so what would the sun look like if I put it far away and only allowed myself to make these sort of cruder measurements, right? So the sun, you know, it's fantastic because there's millions of frequencies, but what if you only could do it? Well, this was done, um, and this is what we call the power spectrum, which I'll explain. This is the frequency of the uh, oscillation that was seen, and this is basically the change in brightness the amplitude of the change in brightness at that frequency. And what you might notice here is a sort of fine tooth cone, and you probably can see even from the back of the room, a very characteristic frequency shift, a frequency spacing directly, right? You can see there's a characteristic frequency spacing between each of these. And there's a forest, there's three different modes here for the physicist, there's L of zero, one, and two. But what you can see is that there's a characteristic frequency spacing this is literally how many nodes there are. If I add another node, the frequency goes up. If I add another node, the frequency goes up. And I'll show you this for the distant stars where we can say that that means there's 10 node crossings within the star. Well, <clears throat> this you can measure in distant stars, and that's why I want to highlight this. This is what we call, this frequency spacing is really just completely equivalent to the time it takes a sound wave to go through the star. And because the star is holding itself up against gravity, if I measure this frequency spacing, delta nu, I actually get to infer the mean density of the star. Because of the fact that it's holding itself up, that's the inference I get. So it's really an integral, it takes the amount of time, it takes a sound wave to get through, but because it's holding itself up, I get to infer the mass and the radius cubed. Now for the sun, that's not exciting. I know how big the sun is in size, I know it's mass, so this is not exciting. For a star halfway across the galaxy, we have no other way of doing this, okay? So that's profound, and it's literally just from reading off the spacing. You might also notice, so let me just say it, let's say that this is, that these, this is 10 nodes, 11, 12, 13, 14, but for some reason as you go to high frequencies, you see this is really tailing off, okay? So if I take the log of that plot on the y-axis to show the same thing, here's that dense spectrum, and you can see in power it really tails off dramatically. And so for some reason, a star can allow for a wave to get to very large amplitude when it has 10 nodes, but when it gets to, let's say, 20, depends on the star, suddenly the amplitude cannot stay large. The waves get damped. And you don't need to really read the slide. Let me just tell you what happens. Very simply is as the wave gets near to the surface of the star, the temperature is low. Temperature at the surface of the sun is much less than the center. And because it's fixed frequency, that means the wavelength has to change. And if the wavelength is getting of order, the size of the last E-folding of the density, what you'd call the atmosphere, think of the atmosphere here, which is about you know, 30,000 feet is one E-folding in the Earth's atmosphere. It looks like either a reflecting boundary or a leaky boundary. So if the wavelength's very short at high frequencies, it leaks out. If the wavelength's long when it gets to that place relative to the thickness of the atmosphere, it's reflective. This is called the acoustic cutoff because we've measured the temperature of the star, distant stars, this allows us to measure uh, little g, gravity. How strong is gravity at the surface? So just measuring that this frequency, there's a frequency above which there's no power or power declines, gives us a direct measure of little g. Okay, so this is now two measurements, a frequency spacing and a maximum power or a maximum frequency. This gives me gm over r squared. Well, I have two variables and two unknowns. So now I can get the mass and the radius, okay? For, again, for the sun, not exciting, All right? But this is a good time to pause because now we're gonna go off and do the rest of the galaxy. So before we leave, and it gets, 
This is the toughest sledding for those who are. So I've got two measurements I have to make, and I'm going to get the mass and the radius of all these stars, if they happen to cooperate. OK. So let's get off. Let's get away from the sun. Let me show you um, other stars. So this diagram is what, in astronomy, we call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It's on the, on the x-axis, the temperature of the surface of the object in Kelvin and log, and the luminosity, of course, in the units of the solar luminosity. So the, and each of these is for a different mass. So here's the sun, uh, one solar mass. And what happens to all of these stars is as they burn out of fuel and leave the main sequence, this core, as I mentioned, in the sun in five billion years will become pure helium. The object will expand in radius, that's this, and it'll brighten, and it'll get very large. And most importantly for us, it becomes, the brightness means the convection becomes even more vigorous. And it's a much larger volume of the stars, what we call a red giant, is undergoing vigorous convection. Because it's getting bigger, the period should get much longer. And, and the hope was that because it's, uh, the convection is more vigorous, that the amplitudes of these waves would be large. This is not a place where theory does a good job at predicting amplitudes, it's hard. Um, but thankfully, in astrophysics, we often don't need to calculate everything uh, because you, the taxpayers, are happy to put something into orbit. Okay? So what I want to show you for the, for the, for the rest of uh, this evening are results from uh, multiple satellites, but these were the two that really opened up the field to us. Satellites put into space, the Crow satellite, which is a French satellite, and then Kepler, which many of you are more familiar with for its ability to find planets around nearby stars by looking for the transit, the planet going in front of the star. I highlight here that these are modest telescopes, 27 centimeter diameter, 95 centimeter diameter. They're in space, so they're pricey, but they're still very modest. The key thing is that they're up above the Earth's atmosphere, and because of that, they can measure the brightness to extremely high accuracy. And that's what we needed to actually make these measurements of how stars are changing their brightness because the amplitude was very low. People had tried this from the ground. Again, many people tried for many years. So it's very hard. <clears throat> so here's what these stars look like. Uh, there's a large envelope that we call the red giant envelope. Here's this uh, core of helium, uh, which is the uh, burned ashes of the, of the uh, it's wiggling now. It's not me. Okay. You're giving me an oscillation. Um, uh, the helium ash of the, of the fuel that was burned during the main sequence. And uh, so here we go. So Corot went into space, and basically immediately every red giant it looked at was oscillating. So each of these panels is a different star with a name. You don't need to, it doesn't matter. What's shown on this axis is the frequency. Uh, on the x-axis, and the y-axis is just the amplitude, how much uh, brightness variations are there at that amplitude. And they've ordered them in order of frequency, so it's easier just to look at the bottom one. So here's one where you can count again, you see the frequency spacing, like I showed you for the sun. And you can see above some frequency, there's no power. This is just noise. And you know that's noise, because you go up and find another star, and look, this one, again, there's frequencies that are spaced, and then there's nothing above it. So basically, their phenomenology is pretty much identical to the sun, but the numbers are all shifted because the star is bigger, if you want to think of it very simply. Um, these, these modes are, are quite small in amplitude, three, three to 200 part per million. That's why you can only do this in space. From the ground, it's very hard to do anything at better than about 1% apart in 100. Kepler launched a little bit later bigger telescope, more data, uh, same exact phenomena plays out. These are all different red giants. Again, it doesn't matter. These are just different names for them, numbers in the catalog. Uh, but here's what I wanted to show you, which is you take the frequency and divide by the frequency spacing. And this is now, you can think of this as how many nodes are there? There's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Number of nodes in the radial coordinate. So again, if you're a musician, you're familiar with this. As you modify and add more nodes, the frequency goes up, and that's the same thing you're seeing 
um, in these stars. And so if I go back to this plot, it's a little bit easier to see for each of these, I can measure a maximum frequency above which there's no power, and I can measure a frequency spacing. So those two measurements allow me to get the mass and radius for the star. Now, at this point, you would say, Lars, you've not told us anything about what a theorist could contribute, which is embarrassing, right? So how does theory play a role in this? Theory plays a role in this by actually checking and confirming that what I'm telling you is true by doing the honest calculation. And those calculations, um, well, let me, uh, were, have really been two one project that I was intimately involved in called MESA, which is a modules for experiments in stellar astrophysics, which is an open source code. And then a code really um, highlighted by Rich Townsend in Wisconsin called Gyre, which does the pulsations. So these are calculations that are spherical stars, but then we do the perturbation analysis to actually understand what the waves are and confirm or deny or modify the sort of simple story I've been telling you. Um, this is what early Corot data looked like for many stars that, that they had uh, using underlying theory, the radius of the objects, the radii of the objects, their masses, uh, and their ages. So <clears throat> it's pretty remarkable to think about looking across the galaxy and saying that star we know is one and a half times the mass of the sun, it's three times the radius, and it's a billion years old. We've never had that capability. So the impact of this work is not only for the stellar astrophysics, someone like myself, but also for those who are trying to understand how the galaxy has been created, what we call sort of galactic archaeology, to really understand how the galaxy was formed and when were stars made within the galaxy. Uh, Kepler, of course, had a lot more data. Uh, this is the distribution of the masses of the objects they found as giants. It doesn't really matter. This is just the best plot I could find for them. Ignore the red versus the blue. Um, and these are the radii. And you've interesting things. So for those astronomers in the crowd, you notice that there's a, a radius for which there's about twice as many stars as usual. Well, this is because there's a phase in a star's evolution where it actually burns its helium. And that phase uh, means that the star gets to live there for a time. It's sort of the main sequence for the helium burning. That's called the red clump. And again, we've known about this, but it's just sort of sitting here in your face. Uh, you know, there's no star that's small. Again, these things we've known. Uh, for stars to become red giants, they have to evolve. And basically, that's why there's almost no low mass objects here. If there are any here, they must have lost some mass somehow. So these, some of these are in binaries. So it's a very, very rich um, data set that really allows us to understand better uh, what's going on. Here's sort of what it looks like uh, in terms of the amplitudes. So the other bit of phenomenology is as the star gets bigger, it gets brighter. As it gets brighter, the convection gets more vigorous. And as the convection gets more vigorous, the amplitude of the modulations gets stronger. So this is the schematic showing that. So here's an object that's quite large, probably maybe 50 times the radius of the sun. This is showing a, a real data from this. But even here, it's not quite yet even at 1%. But these are data. This gives you a sense from the space how well you can do. But when the star is much more compact, you also can see that the amplitude is lower. But you also can see it's higher frequency. I think you can see straight away, this, this has longer time scales in it than this does. And so that object that's smaller oscillates at a higher frequency. OK. Now, the last thing I want to do uh, is sort of one extra bonus. There's two topics I'm not going to talk about, but you can ask me, which is rotation and magnetism, properties that we never really get our hands on for distant stars that we can also do for these stars, but I want to close with, how do we know anything I've told you is true? This is the question you should always ask. It's a great story. How do we know it's true? Well, you get one extra bonus uh, in this exercise, which is that the observers have measured, via a spectrum, the surface temperature of these objects. So these are objects for which we have surface temperatures. I've now given you the radius via this, right, if it's big, it's a long time scale, right? I've given you the radius, and therefore you can calculate the luminosity. Just 4 pi r squared times the Stefan-Boltzmann constant times t to the fourth, and this t is known. 
So that's great. So now I've told you that that star you're seeing has a certain luminosity, certain intrinsic brightness. It's a 100-watt bulb. But I'm measuring some flux at the Earth in my telescope. And obviously, as the object is further away, the flux I see goes down. And that's just shown by this formula, the luminosity divided by 4 pi and the distance squared. So if I've given you the radius and the effective temperature, you can calculate how far away the star is. How else can we get distances to stars? Parallax. Parallax is, we can all do the experiment. Now I'm going to find out who's awake in the audience. This is great. Put your finger out. Awesome. OK, have it cover me. OK, now you've just discovered which eye is your, major, your um, dominant eye. OK, close your right eye. Now switch to the left. What am I doing relative to your finger? I'm moving, right? So parallax is the same phenomena, but when the Earth goes around the sun, you make a measurement six months later of a nearby star relative to some distant object. Okay, that's called parallax. Um, so you can do that, and you can get the, the, um, the check on this. This is first the data. These are the distances. So I haven't yet given you the answer for the check. But the Kepler satellite has, these are the distances for all these different stars, how far away they are in kiloparsecs. Um, the center of our galaxy is about eight kiloparsecs away. TESS is another satellite that's very actively doing this. Um, it, it sees stars, it has a, um, it's not as sensitive, so it sees stars that are closer by. But Gaia is making these parallax measurements. So Gaia is a European mission that's been up for five, six, seven years at this point. And it's measured this parallax for many, many stars. So you can check. So there's a prediction from the astroseismology that's in the, it's on the books, right? It's written down. You go make the measurement, and this is what you see. So this is the distance as inferred by Gaia due to the parallax. So this is geometry. This is the distance inferred by the seismology in the way I showed you, OK? Uh, so, and then here's the scatter. So basically, it's 5 to 10% accurate. And this is the best baseline. We also have things in binaries where you can do the same. Uh, but it's quite remarkable and sort of tells us uh, the power of, of what we've done in terms of accumulated understanding of both the astroseismology of the stars as well as uh, the underlying uh, astrophysics related to their behavior. So in conclusion, I really want you to come away with this strong understanding that when you look at the sky, uh, these stars are varying. I wish we could all see it. Uh, it would have been much more exciting, of course, but I wouldn't be giving the talk because you all would have known it, right? It's because you grow up asking the question. Um, theory really remains a key part of the story. So I love to show this plot. You know, these are the data the observer has, right, for some star. And the beauty of doing physics, theoretical physics, experimental physics, is taking some data stream like that and now telling you it's a star that weighs twice the mass of the sun, it's five times as big, it's uh, a, th a thousand light years away, and it's a billion years old. So thanks this evening, and I'm eager to take more questions. possible to measure the, uh, the spectrum for gravitationally lensed stars? Um, it's a great question. I, uh, you know, stars that get gravitationally lensed, the likelihood, I mean, TESS would be the only satellite that would probably have enough coverage to have the coincidence be detectable. But I, I think the sensitivity is not there. Um, and TESS has a very crowded, has very large pixels, so the images would be crowded, is my guess. Maybe we're in the future? Well, there's always, I mean, how patient are you? I don't know. Yeah. Looks like we have a question here.
Sure, thank you. So um, <clears throat> you can think of it, if you will, as, you know, if you take a glass and you hit it, there's typically just one frequency your ear hears, right? If you put some water in it and hit it, you get a different frequency. So in physics, we would call those different, different eigen, we call them eigenmodes, but different modes that are available given that body. So when we, when we take a star and we ask what are its free oscillations, we have a few different variables. We can consider how many wavelengths I'm trying to get to go around it, how many wavelengths to get to go through it, but I have to close that. It has to be a free oscillation. And each of those is a new mode that we would say is available to the star. I hope that answered. Yeah, okay. Let's go have two questions there. Do these distance, do these distance measurements have anything to say about the Hubble tension? Um, so the, the Hubble tension, for those of you who um, are unfamiliar with it, is a debate going on in the astrophysics community about the value of the Hubble constant, which to me has been going on since I was a kid. It's just the level of disagreement has, has really gotten much tighter. Um, the only variable stars that are used right now for this are what are called Cepheids, uh, which are variable stars that are dramatically variable. These are, you know, these are naked eye variable stars where the, star, the, the size of the star is changing by a factor of two. Um, and so the short, short answer is no, we're not having any impact uh, on, that, on that problem. But there are variable stars used as part of the distance ladder. Um. I have two questions, but I'll just pick one, uh, which is right. We can at the come back to you. Just, give us, <laughs> just start with the best one, and then work your way down. Um, really early on, at the start of the talk, you made a point that um, the reason that you can tell a star's temperature just from the virial theorem, and it's not to do with fusion. Right. And I find that very confusing because, I mean, like the probably the wrong interpretation of that is then a star stops fusing, but it maintains its temperature. Yeah. And that sounds incorrect. I was wondering if you could clarify sure. what that means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so the way a star works is the first part I told you is the easy part. If you give me a, a mass and a radius, that's how hot it is at the center. Okay, that's step one. Step two is what's the rate of heat that's leaving the object? Okay, so it's hot at the center, it's cold at the surface. So there's a heat loss, which we call a luminosity, but just think of it as a heat loss. So that then would say, um, if the star has no energy, no fusion available to it, it has to make up that heat loss by undergoing gravitational contraction upon itself. So what happens is the star contracts upon itself, the temperature rises, okay, until, and that process continues, the star contracts, 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 until you get to a temperature where something else can supply the luminosity, and that's fusion. And so if you, so if you ask why does the sun have the radius it has today, it's because that's the radius it needs to have to have the fusion luminosity match the heat loss. And so it lives there just burning away happily for 10 billion years. So yeah, so don't let anybody tell you that fusion has set the temperature. I mean, well, whatever. I, I have a bias here about how to explain the physics. But. Yeah. So I have a question here. Hey. Stellar formation, yeah. So, so let me give you one example. Um, so the sun today is, is uh, in the interior I showed you, is, has a certain rotation rate. So this is called a month, okay. What's going to happen to the interior of the sun as, as it runs out of fuel is that core is going to contract because it has to, it's run out of fuel, it can't match, so it's going to contract. Um, if, you, if we didn't have any loss of angular momentum and it contracts, of course, it will spin up. So one challenge we have in stellar evolution is, is that that spin up could be so dramatic that you end up being centrifugally held up, that there's a, a rate at which basically you're matched by gravity. And so what we are starting to see with astroseismology is if we take stars that probably were like the sun and we see them today as a giant, we see evidence that those deep cores have lost about 90 to 95% of their angular momentum already. 
It's a big mystery about how it happens, but we're seeing evidence that rotation, that we're losing angular momentum from the interior. And that is helping us because that will allow it to continue to collapse. So it's not quite addressing your question, but that's one way in which we can start to infer what's going to happen going forward. Uh, does metallicity affect things at all, especially on like the really like extremely metal poor end of stars? Yeah, so, so um, let, me, let me unpack your question a little bit. So in astronomy, so many of you are physicists and a metal is, a, is probably well-defined, right? It's, it's something that conducts electricity typically, right? If you're a kinetic matter physicist, like I was raised initially. Um, to an astronomer, a metal is anything heavier than helium, okay? <laughs> Uh, and the reason we do that is because all of those elements heavier than helium are being made in stellar evolution. And so, uh, so when you have the first generation of stars, there's no metals, it's just hydrogen and helium. But as you've gone through life cycles and made heavy elements, then, then what we call the metallicity, the amount of mass in elements heavier than helium grows. Uh, that has a big, con uh, that matters for the star because it ends up setting typically uh, just how it radiates at its surface. And so you can get different sized stars due to metallicity. So the answer to your question is, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of dynamic range of metallicity for these stars because they're all pretty much in the galactic disk. So um, there's, you know, there's not a lot of metal poor stars, but th I mean, there are some I'm sure in these samples, but we're mostly studying red giants. So the metal poor stars that are red giants are typically hotter um, than this, but, but again, they're, they're fully convective. So I wouldn't expect a big difference. That's the technical answer, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I can, I'll take questions all night. You, you <laughs> tell me when to be done. Okay, uh, our sun has a well-known solar cycle, magnetic solar yeah, cycle. Yes, yes. Uh, does theory predict any other star stellar cycle one and does observation have any evidence of other stars' magnetic cycle? Yeah, so there's definitely, uh, there are other stars in our galaxy that undergo cycles uh, that are solar-like in, in duration or period, for sure. Um, the underlying theory for the cause of that is still actively debated. It definitely has to do with the fact that in the sun, there's a, a region between this fully convective region and the underlying material that's not convecting. And you may have noticed that the, the solid, sorry, the interior rotates like a solid body, but it's not solid, it's a gas, but the outer part doesn't. And so there's areas where there's tremendous shear um, and, and the, the neutral point sort of at mid latitude. And so the, the, the understanding is a lot of the magnetism and growth of magnetic fields that lead to sunspots has to do with that shearing layer. And we think that condition is present in a lot of other stars. Well, this question is a bit of a setup, but when you showed the distribution of uh, radii and masses of stars, they didn't actually go down all the way to where stars end. So um, <clears throat> you want to comment on that? You mean this one? Yeah, so, right, so this, this sample are the sample of pulsating stars via this method. So these have to be red giants or, or subgiants or even barely on the main sequence. So I think, Gabor, what you're asking is well, why not a 0.5 or a 0.4? Right, so lower mass stars, um, if you go to very low mass stars, they are fully convective. So everything I said is true. They're bubbling and they're boiling, but so far, We've not seen any oscillations that are like this in those types of stars. People have looked, they keep looking. The sense is probably because of the luminosity and the amplitude of the velocities, it's not adequate to build up to be a detectable amplitude. But because we can't really predict the amplitude, we don't know. So it would be really exciting, but we haven't found it. Yeah. Please. Yes, is there a rendition, earthly rendition of the music of the stars? Yeah, I didn't do it. Um, Cause I, I think it's better if you imagine it you know, personally, but um, you have to decide what frequency you want to hear at. So people have taken these Kepler objects and you shifted the frequency into the audio. Uh, and I think if you probably look up, I haven't Googled it, but I know you can find it. If Kepler music of the spheres, you'll probably find it. Um, but yeah. 
Is there something like the sound barrier uh, in other mediums than air? So, for example, in, in water or in a star, is there something like the sound barrier that could be broken and that could create some interesting shock uh, waves? Or? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so I think what you're asking about is sort of supersonic, supersonic transport, right? So most of these stars, the velocities uh, I'm talking about of the motion are less than the sound speed. So we're not causing shock waves. There are other stars uh, that are brighter, more massive, and particularly more vigorous, where we think the convective motion gets really close to the sound speed. For these stars, when it, if it happens, it's only in the very surface layers because the density is very low. And so to carry the heat, it has to move faster because it knows about the density. So, but we don't see anything here that tells us there's any shocks going on in these data, but there's other data that we, you know, many of us are actively pursuing other problems where we really care about the convection getting nearer to the sound speed. Yes, for sure. I may not have understood it properly, but um, how in this theory do we account for the variance in viscosity uh, of like the star's different layers? Yeah. So um, if you're a fluid dynamicist, you, you, you definitely care about the viscosity of the fluid you're in, right? And the measurement of does viscosity matter is compared to the velocity of the fluid and its length scale of the motion. Those, we compare that dimensionally to the viscosity. Um, these are, in stars, uh, that ratio is so large that the product of those two quantities is so much larger than the physical viscosity that we ignore viscosity. Or to a fluid dynamicist, I would, it's that the Reynolds number is huge. Um, and so we don't worry about microphysical viscosity like you would for molasses in any of these cases. There's other ways of getting viscosity having to do with magnetic fields, which is a very rich topic, um, which I did not touch. <laughs> 